Okay, 705, the uh, September 17th meeting of the Jericho Planning Commission has come to order. Thank you so much, everybody who's here today. Planning Commission members, we would like to recognize that this is Sarah McLeod's last Planning Commission meeting with us. Here, here. She has decided to move on to other things. We're very sorry to see her leave the Planning Commission, but we know where she lives. <laughs> right over there, right over there, over here. Right. Shout out to the yes. We saw that this yeah. Yeah. There is a tremendous asset, asset to the Planning Commission. He served as the clerk for several terms, which has been a great right-hand resource for me. I'm very sorry to see her go. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, and thank you very much for running the last meeting and several meetings for the last several months while I've been out. Um, so for tonight's agenda, we'll have time for public comment, approved minutes, the majority of our time. We are really looking forward to hearing from David White, our consultant working with us on our bylaw modernization grant. And we have a um, batch of uh, draft changes to our zoning to um, hear from him about and potentially discuss. Then we will do a round robin of um, reports and updates from planning commission members, other business, and then we actually have more treats to share to recognize Sarah's departure. So don't fill up on the brownies. Um, and uh, and then we'll adjourn. Does anybody need to make any changes to the agenda? Did you say Sarah's departure? Sarah's. You're leaving the planning commission. Yes, my family needs me. I'm taking a brief hiatus from community service. If it if it helps you feel better, I'm also retiring from my position at the treasurer of the Little League and several other things on Doug's food shelf. I'm taking a break. Hey, this is for yeah, I'm I'm taking a break. My kids, um, my husband doesn't have an assistant coach this winter, and my younger son's going to be a U14 skier, which requires three days a week of travel. So. Go for it. Time of your life. Right. Yeah, but she's here an extremely prosperous and busy business person yeah, yes. running her real estate empire. Nice. <laughs> um, okay. So, any other any changes to the agenda? All right. I would uh, welcome public comment. I may. Yes, please. Um, as you know, my name is Michael Oman, and I am not a Jericho resident, so thank you for your indulgence. I have been working very hard on the Wisdom House project that has been involved with a lot of things going on here. Um, also, my, my past um, experience, so I'm a retired community and transportation planner, one of my specializations within that is the parking. So I wanted to take an opportunity to share a few things with you. I'm quite sure that David White is going to be bringing almost everything, and probably everything you need. But there were one or two things I thought would be really worthwhile to just call out uh, fairly quickly. Um, obviously, we're all aware of the issues associated with parking. First issue, we need it. You can't get by in any kind of significant development without it. Everybody goes by car. We've got to provide it. We've got to find a way to do it successfully, hopefully not excessively. However, we're also aware of the incredible impacts and costs that are associated with it. Um, fosters auto orientation, um, the, lots of impervious surface and runoff associated with it, all of that sort of things. The most important things in my mind that often get forgotten are the opportunity costs associated with parking. That is the things that you can't do when you do it. Um, you can't have a garden there. You can't have a play area there. You can't have pedestrian facilities there. All of those things are, are incredibly important. One of them almost never gets thought about, and I made this very, very poor little graphic here. This is my, this is my, uh, my prop for today. So um, this is basically my little parking lot, three parking spaces. Um, the conventional figure that we use for just a for super planning level parking analysis is 350 square feet per parking space in a surface parking lot. So. That's the, that's the area that's actually taken up with it. Fine, so far, so good. However, the thing that I think is really important that it almost never gets thought about is the fact that in a three-story district, um, that means that you also have the capability of putting two additional stories and including that story for actual uses. 
take 350 square feet and multiply it by three, you wind up with a thousand square feet. Thousand square feet represents essentially one small retail unit, one housing unit. Every single parking space you require, basically you are eliminating the possibility of one housing unit in a village area, which is one of your critical areas, every single one. So you should be, what I'm saying is not that we can't have any parking, but we need to be very judicious and very thoughtful about how we deal with it. So I do have some suggestions for that too. Um, one other thing that I'd like to bring up, um, this, is, this is another one of my props, it's just a parking lot, we've all seen these. Um, almost everyone recognizes that parking is in essentially in a village and town center setting, is often referred to as avoiding influence. The cold in the winter, the dead in spaces, the fact that you can't actually do anything with it, it is a form of blight. Um, what you're doing when you require parking as part of your zoning is you are requiring, not allowing, but requiring the inclusion of blight in what you're doing. So again, be very judicious about what you're doing. Saying don't do it, be terribly important, but just be aware of what you're doing. So. Question is, is there anything you can do about it? I say, ha, yes, there's an answer. For you Douglas Adams fans, you may find this very nice. The answer is 85%. Um, now that's, you know, it's a little different for 42, but 85% is the number that you are trying to achieve in terms of occupancy of parking spaces. That is the number, literally, that means that parking is being used to its peak efficiency and that there will always be a parking space for someone who needs it when they get there. Any much higher than that and you don't wind up, people wind up not being able to find parking spaces, much lower than that and you're underutilizing the parking. It's a very simple number. It can be very difficult to get at 85% in terms of time, time of year, time of day, mix of uses, other access forms, so on and so forth. So that basically is um, how you actually get there becomes the question. So. Do I have a suggestion for that? Yes, I do. Um, you Can may I stop you right there because yes, um, we are trying to keep comments to a limit. Yep. So I would ask if um, your suggestions would you be? But we are about to talk about this. Yep. So I want to ask planning commission people if we can extend another three minutes. To this speaker. Can they object to that? That's okay. Sure. Okay. One minute will probably do it. Okay, great. Thank um, you. Basically, I, I tried to make this quite compact. Yeah, and I appreciate you talking fast. So uh, talk. Yeah, I'm also talking a little fast. Yes. So I apologize about that. But um, so all of you have heard me talk about it various times or heard us talk about the importance of negotiations and collaborative zoning. And parking is one of the places where this becomes really real. This is one of the places where the community and the developers and owners can all work together and arrive at a solution that really works so that you can actually make it happen and, and work out all of the ins and outs and all of the, the pluses and minuses that are associated with it. So very simply put, I'm quite confident that David will have a lot of the information, pretty much all the information you need. I just want these little things in your mind if you want my recommendation, I would say that a lot of places are beginning to eliminate minimum parking requirements. I believe that Jericho could do it quite well, um, especially you know, in the in the um, village areas. Um, uh, it, uh, it could be, but the thing of it is that in the other areas, it doesn't really matter very much. So I mean, who cares if there's a little, too little, too much? You got an extra parking space in a McMansion parking uh, driveway. So um, I suggest eliminating them, going to a negotiated means to make absolutely certain you get what you need out of it. And I feel confident that David can guide you through that process. Thank you very much for letting me. Thank you very much. Any other public comments? You know, this thing doesn't work. Does not? No. Eric, can you hear the um, public comment? He said, yeah. He said, yeah. Yes, I can hear quite clearly. Okay, thank I'll you. To try. Uh, anyway, I've I, I watched select board meetings anyway. Uh, I'm sorry you're leaving. I'm sorry you're leaving. No, Sabina's not leaving. Sarah. Sarah I'm the only one. She's Sarah. I'm Sabina. Okay. I'm staying. I she was saying you left. Oh, I might have misspoken. Yeah. No, you. Thank you. Oh, just okay. me. All right. And the only one. Um, you know, this is probably the most functional, highly talented. You know, commission Jericho's ever had, at least in the time I've been here. And Sarah, you're a big part of that, and uh, we're going to miss you. Um, 
we're particularly good this summer. Um, SJ uh, made uh, the housing committee made a set of recommendations to you and the select board last summer. Uh, you rejected most of them, and the select board ignored them and never got back to us. Uh, we have a new set of recommendations that I think build on those. I think what we we should have done a better job of insisting on a point by point discussion. If the town is going to appoint a committee to work on something, it really particularly the select board needs to respond to the work. Um, SJ presented the uh, housing assessment to the select board last week with a set of recommendations. Uh, I uh, printed out the recommendations, each her slides. Uh, her slides are like 21 pages. I printed out about that film. And the core thing is um, we're hoping we were unsuccessful last year at getting you to assess the fundamental, your fundamental policy and the select board's fundamental policy of reserving 86% of Jericho for the wealthy. I mean, it's just plain wrong in terms of just a sense of justice. And, you know, we have, and now the select board is clearly, you know, <laughs> we reserve most of the town for the wealthy and then we plan on doing infrastructure and then just never do it. And the playbook is playing out again and you're watching it happen. The, uh, the, the, the study, was, the, the town plan says the wastewater study was supposed to be done in the early part of 2024. Then in June, it was just 60% done. The guy said it was going to be done in two months. In two months, he said two weeks. In two weeks, he said five weeks. It's still not done. And the select board, to my knowledge, has not called the boys and king and said, get this done. You have no shot at getting any more engineering work from us. If you don't, just, if it's going to take more than two years, to do this little infrastructure study, how long is it going to take to do the actual engineering and, and produce it? You rejected the idea of putting dates in the town plan for when things are going to get done. So there's just no accountability on this. The select board is taking full advantage of that. I printed out the uh, the recommendations, and I hope that it can be a point by point response or in interaction between the planning commission and the housing uh, committee on these things. Uh, and we are definitely going to insist on um, having that with the, uh, you know, with the select board. So we'll pass that out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I just ask a point of clarification? Chris, are you home and Chris Flynn, or is home somebody different? Okay. Thank you, Justice. We have a participant named Home. Yeah, if you're the person called Home, can you just identify yourself, please? Okay, I guess we proceed. Um. Any other public comment? If you're online and want to make a comment, you can either raise your hand or just unmute yourself. We don't have so many people. So yeah, it is Chris. Yeah, yeah that was no, but he had one called Chris Flynn. Yeah. Well, I I think it might. That's why I was wondering if it was both of his. But all right. I. Okay, we'll move on. We'll move on. Okay, our next topic is um, discussing minimum parking requirements, which is a holdover continuation of a discussion that occurred at the last PC meeting where you were, David, not in attendance, so I'm quite glad that you're here. I wasn't here, so I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to kick off the discussion. Sure. So the minimum parking requirements that are currently in the zoning that we reviewed, that were part of the, the section of zoning that we reviewed, um, I feel strongly, and I know Chris feels strongly, that we should not have a minimum parking requirement at all, that we should go the route of other uh, these towns and even entire states and remove all parking requirements from all of the town zoning. So um, I sent an article to go with it. And I'm curious if anyone has a, I, I would love to hear the other viewpoints of why that shouldn't happen. 
if somebody has that. You know, I, 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 I agree. So I don't, I don't have it in front of the. You agree. So yeah. you, you would support removing yes. minimum parking requirements. And, and, and I also would, this is a separate issue, but it, to me it's related because it's parking, but I would also try to figure out how we can incentivize um, pervious surfaces mm -hmm. when, when parking is mm -hmm. uh, necessary. Yes, when it is required. Like yes. Yes. What point? what? Pervious. 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 Surfaces. You're talking like bricks that have. Surfaces. Yeah, there's a variety. Yes. Yeah, Grass, green, and all that stuff. Yeah. I did a. I did follow up. Thank you, Sarah, for offering the article. And then I did a little searching because I thought it'd be really helpful to have a rural perspective because I think rural development. Um. And decision making is really different than what's happening in, in larger cities and towns. And I didn't find anything. I mean, uh, that really spoke to any challenges or ways of thinking it through a rural perspective. Um, so I didn't know whether to feel really good about that or to <laughs> not feel good about it, but I just wanted to show that I did look. Um, and I, I went a little deeper and, and there were folks that said, don't, you know, it's hot now. We often don't know, like it, it is where people are going. And just as with the initial recommendation that there always needed to be working that had unintended consequences, be aware that we might not know right now what some of those might be. And so the only ones that came up were uh, increased congestion because people were like circling around looking for parking and I thought curious not something that we are experiencing now but if we did have a larger space that developed is that something that we would need to be thinking about like the circulation ability um, and then the other was um, having a spaces for people who really don't have any other transportation alternatives and that is definitely true of our rural place is that there, like you can't get from here to there for many people without a car, or if you have certain um, abilities that require you to use motorized vehicles, and that we really do need to be taking into account that there will be remain a population that needs to always have a designated space. And so um in our public spaces and in our larger spaces that we need to be planning for that. So I don't know what that means then in terms of eliminating requirements entirely, because I do believe in it, it is a public responsibility to ensure equal access to public utilities and amenities in the community. Are you refer referring to um, uh, parking for people with disabilities or something else? I, primarily, yeah. Because I thought that was, a, I thought that would not eliminate parking. It would not. It yeah. could not. So that's saying that. That's governed by, that's governed by something. Okay. So saying that we didn't have a parking minimum or requirement does not negate that federal. Yeah, right. That's the only thing that I was worried about. And, and I think, again, I don't want to speak too much for Chris, but our feeling is that a developer, a developer, is going to take into account what they're building, who they're building it for, and what the parking needs are. That us, you know, buttering a regulation doesn't doesn't address the nuance of what's actually being built and for whom and what the traffic and, and needs are. So a developer would be thinking about those things. So it's not to say that we expect a bunch of buildings to be built with no parking. It's just to say the the statutes don't need to mm -hmm. govern it. I'm uncomfortable with that as long as there remains that federal requirement as a safeguard. Yeah, we can't get around that. Then then I'm I am I would be very uncomfortable if that safeguard were not there. Okay, Eric, do you have anything you'd like to add? Actually, yeah, yeah, I, I the piece I'm worried about is the tragedy of the commons issue. If a developer knows they're not required to put up any specific amount of parking, what's to prevent them from, say, I'm not putting any in there, and force the parking to be on either public spaces, roads on the side of there, or 
to make their parking choice for their tenants or the, whoever's using the building to be on somebody else's lot. So I would encourage us to have some degree of parking as a minimum, just to make sure that the developer doesn't say, hey, I'm just gonna save myself a couple hundred thousand bucks by telling people park on the street. I wonder if that goes back to the suggestion, and I'm I'm sorry, sir, who Michael. Michael made that there's a negotiated space that happens during that's not about a minimum or a maximum, but just a conversation of some kind of negotiated space. I didn't know what you meant by that. That's exactly what that. I meant by that. Okay. That's exactly what I meant by that, to make sure that these things were getting satisfied from both the towns. And the developer's point of view that there was no nothing lost in that process. That's one of the things that a negotiated uh, collaborative permitting process could afford. Okay, going around the circle then, Sabina, do you have anything? I'm in favor of everything that I've read from the um, pedestrian friendly realm. It also supports that kind of. Um, but no minimum, so I'm in favor. Mm -hmm. So then I would guess I would ask for like the rebuttal from the experts, either David or Chris Flynn. What are we not thinking Chris about? We can we... talk. Okay, so. But he can type in the chat. He can type and also let's just also say that we're I we're getting like the basic pulse and the basic direction, but we are in the process of reviewing drafts. So I'm thinking you're gonna be listening to all this, we'll summarize and then we'll be reviewing a new draft to that section like all the other sections. So we're we're not we're not to finalize anything right this minute. I'm not gonna rebut anything anyone has has said here because I think a parking space, why we require parking spaces has a long and sorted history uh, in zoning in this country. And it's based on what it's, you know, it, it really isn't based on fact of what actual parking demand is. <clears throat> so um, as Michael points out quite well, um, it adds significantly to the cost of development period when you require an excessive number of spaces. Now what's excessive? You know, that kind of depends, but um, <clears throat> as um, <clears throat> Eric points out, the, the counter to that is spillover. So a uh, place that uh, is in high demand, has doesn't have a lot of parking spaces, people find other places to park. They park on the street, they park in the yard, things like that. So this is where you need to adequately manage parking across the community. Where can people park and where can't they park? You can't park in the front lawn. You know, you, you have streets that are designed to accommodate on-street parking. You know, that that's a great public resource. Um, I don't think you need to improve parking requirements. Um, I would certainly encourage and support you to, to take them out. Um, typically, the ADA requirement, um, Heidi, for parking spaces is based on the number of parking spaces that are provided. Um, so, not the number of parking spaces that are required by a municipality. So, you know, depending on how many parking spaces the development um, builds, the ADA num number of ADA spaces is proportional to the number that are provided. But the financer of the development um, is going to be one of the primary entities that's going to ensure that there is at least some parking to make sure that whatever the use is adequately supported with what they need in order to be successful. You know, that the developer is gonna have that front of mind as to what do I need to make this um, successful? It's unlikely that in a place like Jericho where there aren't many options, there aren't a lot of places that you can go um, and you can live car free that pretty much everything is going to provide some part um, but is it a parking space for every dwelling unit? Maybe not. You know, you have opportunities to share parking spaces across that, you know, across that project. So um, at your direction, I'm happy to remove those parking requirements from I think it's section 11. Plus. 14. Did you guys get to read Chris's comments? Yeah. 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 Can you read it out loud, Sabina, if you don't mind? Um, 
Serena, if the PC is going to get caught in the weeds, let's table this for a work session and not take time away from the meeting. Okay. Um, I, I guess I would say we, we're open to seeing uh, in your next draft a removal or a drastic reduction. And I would, um, we don't have to respond to this now, but just think about enforcement and dealing with conflicts in a town that doesn't have a, a police department and what kind of responsibility would the select board then have to resolve disputes because we don't want to just throw the problem down the hill. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, so I close that topic. Thank you very much. Thanks for the research. Uh, okay, then I'll invite David to come forward and launch us into discussing his next round of suggested amendments for your code zoning. And won't tell me how tell you how many years it took me to get the city of Burlington to remove its minimum amount of Burlington removed it completely. You guys just did it in like a couple of weeks. Um yes. I'm gonna share my screen. Here we go. Um fairly short presentation to focus on the uh, highlights of the proposed changes in what I think we're referring to as batch number two. Um, so batch number two, um, you know, this is just a reminder of what it is that we're trying to achieve um, based on what the town plan is seeking and what the what the grant requirements are. Um, ultimately, these are more focused objectives behind the changes to, to four, the four sections that um, you received a couple of weeks ago. Um, in particular, the, the previous batch really was about process and the decision-making process and, and the regulatory process and the review process. Now we get into the substance of what the regulations actually require or not. So here we get to, I think, the places where um, the commission, the housing committee, and others may have more of an interest. Um, really, this is where we focus on creating a much wider range of housing uh, opportunities as well as mixed use and compact development um, in the village centers. Um, and particularly, again, like with some of the other sections, improve the consistency in the use of the terms um, to unlock the infill potential on on um, you know larger and particularly deeper lots in the village centers, um, and some updates relative to state statute. So tonight's topics are four different sections of the current regulations. Um, section number two are the definitions. Section three are the creation of the zoning districts. Section four are zoning uses, and section five are the the dimensional standards. So. <clears throat> Depending on how you want to do this, I've got a kind of a, a slide or two on each one of these, kind of highlighting what the changes are. We can kind of take them in pieces. I'll present here what those highlights are, and then we can have a conversation about it, or we can get through the whole thing and have a conversation at the end. Kind of, um, share what's your pleasure. Uh, I would say questions by section. We'll just keep an eye on the time and help us if we like Chris is saying, getting caught because this is not our only opportunity to review this. Right, okay. right. And you, you know, you've had this for a couple of weeks now. So section two is definitions. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. And, and my recommendation recommendation with this one off the um, off the bat is we may want to talk about this in relation to talking about uses because the first thing we did is make sure that every use in the use table has a definition. Um, and that definitions of uses that aren't in the use table are eliminated from the definition. You don't need to define something if it's not pertinent uh, to what you're regulating. So there's a lot of the changes are based on those two things. Um, another really important component of definitions is that they are just that. They're only a definition. You don't include the regulations or regulatory standards in a definition. Um, you include that elsewhere. So there are a few places where that was taken out and was put someplace else. 
Um, and I try to align definitions with state definitions where applicable. Um, this is particularly important around things like um, whether it's uh, home occupations, uh, things that are particularly protected under state statutes. So agriculture, farms, home occupation, um, group homes, daycares, things like that that are regulated by the state. You know, you are piggybacking or making reference to those definitions and some of those regulatory structures to how you define something. A good example are daycares. The state has a structure with how they regulate daycares. If you're consistent in calling a home day family home daycare this, using the same name that the state does, then everybody knows what you're talking about. So that's definitions. And like I said, many of them are related to uses. So when you get to uses, that may be more useful conversation, unless there are specific questions that people have. <clears throat> All right, let's keep moving. Uh, yeah, I, I had questions, but most of my questions are minor that I think I can just deliver yep. to you in email. Yep. Um, I had a, a couple just to mention. So one of them is the that um, we don't have a definition for forest block or forest blocks. Actually, Sabina pointed this out. Mm -hmm. And do we need that to kind of prepare for the yeah. next the next, right, the update of the NRO, which will follow this pretty closely. When you do that update of the NRO and you specifically use that term and regulate forested blocks in a particular way from something else, that's when you should include that definition. Okay. Um, and then since it's related to housing, we have definitions. Well, yeah, it's like, is it a, are we already using the term forest block? The NRO no does not regulate that as a resource. If there's a large habitat block, right? Oh. Um, oh, no. but we have, but we need to. We need to oh, to update that. So we have both a mobile home and a manufactured home, and those are two different things, but they are they look really close. Those definitions, and I didn't follow it all the way through to look at how the use table addressed each of those differently or it, the use table wouldn't treat them differently but you're right they are different right right I, so when a mobile home is a manufactured home but a, but a manufactured home is not necessarily mobile okay so just maybe when we get to the use table just maybe make i'll make sure that i'm aware of what you're saying there mm -hmm. uh and i think other than that it's pretty minor questions okay. Okay. Thank you. Can I add one yes. more thing? So, is a tiny home a manufactured home? Not so, typically, a manufactured home would be something that's manufactured off site and brought on site, either in pieces. <clears throat> maybe they're panels, but maybe they're, you know, like part, you know, two parts of a building. So, a tiny home could be built and stick built entirely on site. So, it may or may not may not be i think the point being is that you want to be sure that you're not just you're not you don't want to discriminate against either one right there's a lot of construction that happens these days that is some sort of a manufactured home you know sometimes it's you know the the two halves of the house that you see driving down the interstate um, and sometimes it is you know a collection of panels that get assembled but you know that's all perfectly suitable um, great housing that's getting built that way. It's, it's affordable, it's energy efficient, um, and so you want to be sure that you're, you're not discouraging that type of construction methodology, and you certainly don't want to and can't under state law just um, eliminate manufactured homes, as, at least as a single entity. Okay? Thank you. All right. Zoning districts. Um, there's not really a lot in the way of changes to this particular section, but they're, they're important. So it created a more of a global heading of a grouping of zoning districts called village centered districts. This way you, we can refer to all of them collectively, um, or they can be referred to individually. 
And those are the Riverside Neighborhood Center, Jericho Corners, and Jericho Center. So they were all once considered Village Center Zoning District. <clears throat> they are now separate districts, polygons on the map, with some variation in uses and um, dimensional room. Environment? Maybe not, but uses for sure. Um, but there's many places throughout the, the regulations where we refer to as village center districts collectively because certain kinds of things are enabled for all of them, not just one of them. Um, and I created revised and more concise purpose statements for, for each one of them. Um, I have a few maps here. So this is what the zoning map, pretty much what it looks like now. It doesn't look a whole lot different um, than what it is now, but I did need ultimately need to reflect the Riverside Village Code uh, districts. So just zooming in here, these are those through three um, village center districts, Riverside, Jericho Corners, and Jericho Center. So with regard to Jericho Corners and Jericho Center, there's no change to the boundaries um, from what they are today. Um, and Riverside Center neighborhood, um, those boundaries are, are changed a bit um, per our conversations around the form code. And we'll talk more about that later. So that's those. And then just as a preview for the Vill Riverside Village Code. Go back for one second. Mm -hmm. So what does white mean? Uh, the, the white in the Riverside Village Center is, is what part of the form district. I just took it out for okay. to make it look cleaner. And in the Jericho Corners, mm -hmm. the white corner is Essex. Right. No, I know that. Yeah. So th this is then the regulating plan for the Riverside Village Code. So the Village Center and the Civic. Zone, but we'll talk about more of that, more about this one later. So let me just go back and see, are there particular questions or things you'd like to talk about relative to this? I just had a question about the, the red line document itself. Is that appropriate to? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at the definitions of all the um, uh, places that we're talking about, all the village districts. So all those definitions are new. Am I reading that correctly? Because it's all red and underlined. Yes. It's, so it's just not the definition of Riverside Village Center District and Riverside Village Neighborhood District. It's new. All right. Of them. I I made each description or purpose statement for those districts more concise. Okay. Any other comments or questions on districts? Okay, I did, of course. Sounds like a shopping center. Um, the definitions are much improved, but my OCD brain needs them to be sort of exact replicas of one another in to some degree. Mm -hmm. like the sentence structures are not exactly mm -hmm. the same. Some of them talk a little bit more about future development than others. Granted, future development is more appropriate, but I would like to see the yeah. sentences like exactly line up with only the things that are different about them. Yeah. And um, the thing that was missing for me, they did a really good job of talking about like people and business and mixed use and housing, but there was no mention of the schools. And each of them plays an important role in just having the proximity to the schools, which I think should be mentioned in the purpose. Like Jericho Center is kind of adjacent to the high school, but the others, the school is really like a rallying point. Mm -hmm. And when we think about development and the fact that there's kids there and families there and schools there and play and learning. 
Okay. All right, anybody else? Okay, we'll move on. Uses. As you can imagine, this took a lot of time to sort out and much of the changes that were made here were based on conversations we had back in the spring um, around uses in each of these districts. So big changes here is that it's a new table that includes all of the uses in all of the districts, including the form districts, uh, all in one place. Rather than having uses defined in a use table in the form code and a separate one in this code, they're all in the same place. Form code simply says, with regard to uses, see section four. Um, so that was, that's key. Um, based on those earlier conversations, we, we talked about um, rearranging the uses we talked about grouping them under kind of like groupings of manufacturing versus housing versus uh, the fleet of exempt types of uh, uses, um, special kinds of housing arrangements. Um, and looking particularly across the four um, zoning districts, which of those uses are most appropriate in uh, in each one of those areas? With the the one place that I think deserves some kind of special thought is Jericho Center, given its scale, given its uh, proximity or lack of access to many of the things. There's a lot of particularly commercial uses that are probably not suitable there and they're just not likely to happen because there's not enough of a market to justify that. But um, that's something for you to kind of think through in more detail. Um, this section also specifically speaks for to allowing for multiple principal uses and principal buildings on an individual site, um, which was a key provision that we discussed earlier. Um, I took all, everything in I forget what the two sections of the of the code are, but there were regulations that were use related regulations in different parts of the code. I put them all together as part of section four. So if you want to know about how a use is regulated, whether it's in the use table or whether it has to do with you know drive throughs or earth extraction or something like that, it's all in this one section. Uh, um, and I think the one thing I added to that list is there weren't specific provisions around outdoor dining and entertainment. So I added. So what are your thoughts about this? I had some um, questions around. So I'm looking at residential. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start with the household unit. So um, can we see that on the screen? Is that possible? Yes. I'm looking at like the two the two point one. So a household unit can be any kind of manufacturing type. Is, is that is that am I interpreting that? It could be a mobile home. It could be a manufactured home. It can be. Any, tiny home. Tiny yep. home, it can be any. It's just a unit. It's, it's just one unit. A, a, a single dwelling unit versus some, you know, something that is, you know, multiple units. But it's sleep area for sleeping, cooking, and whatever the definition of a dwelling unit is. It's not with regard to its construction type. So it is. Hard and I had the same question because in the definitions section we have household, mm -hmm. but we don't have household unit. And so household is defined as an individual or two persons or more related by marriage 
blah, blah, blah. It's about the, the people as opposed to the structure. So as somebody yes. who is not as engaged, I also see household unit in table of use, but household in definitions and don't know what. So should that say how dwelling unit? It's, is it mm -hmm. missing the word dwelling? Because the, dwelling unit is also defined. Yeah, I'm just thinking we, we need to make sure that there's a, some some kind of cross match or it's not clear. Mm -hmm. So when you look at those two things, they are confusing. Yeah. I'm just thinking what what is a physical a dwelling unit is a physical thing, mm -hmm. whereas the household household unit is you know that kind of living condition. Uh, well, no, the way household is defined in definitions is about the people. It's yeah, about right. people. It's not about condition. It's, it's occupants. Right. right. So I looked at that. My note says missing the word dwelling. We have a single household dwelling. Oh, okay. So yeah, so just just making sure that there's some kind of cross match, yep. so we're clear. I will. This is I will look into that. Thing. I mean, the, the point being is that you know, I think I don't know whether this was something that I included or where it came from, but using household unit as opposed to family, which is yeah. like yes. traditionally how this should be referred right. to. It's a you know, it's it's that. Kind of transition, but it's a it's a single unit. Yes, it used right. to say single family dwelling unit. And right, should not. Right, but it, we change this planning commission or this you know, this exact planning commission changed it from family to household mm -hmm. for their, that very specific reason. Yeah, yeah. But we retained the word dwelling unit okay. at least in the parts of the table. Yeah. Okay, I will. I Thank can clean that. So sorry if that was not when you were going no, no. to that's, that, that's helpful. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't, that the lack of, of not, you know, not specifically calling out like mobile home. Uh, well, so David, you had said initially building on that comment <laughs> that every use now has a definition. And if it's not regulated, you took out the definition. So why do we still need a definition for manufactured home or mobile home if it actually is covered by this term of a dwelling unit? So you, there is also included here mm -hmm. mobile home parks. Yes. Which is different than just a single mobile home. Correct. And they typically have different kinds of and a site plan considerations with a mobile home park. So a single mobile home cannot be treated any differently than any other single dwelling unit. Um, but mobile home, as I said, mobile home parks are typically have their own kind of set of regulations. You have them in your code um, about how the lots are treated. Like. So that's where mobile home would be defined as to well, a mobile home park, but what's a mobile? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not a jerk. Okay, more kind of big, bigger discussion worthy questions or comments, not to try to restrain the conversation, but looking at Chris Flynn's comment also. We can deliver a lot of comments and questions to David, but the time together yep. is so valuable. This is a great time for questions mm -hmm. or, you know, there's a hot topic that you want right. to get to. Um, so you have introduced something about, about, you clarified the difference between allowed uses, permitted uses, exempt uses, I think. Correct. Well, that you have, that there are three, three mm -hmm. types. There are things that are exempt, they don't require a permit at all. Right. Those are particularly things that are exempt under state law. Then there are either permitted uses or conditional uses. You don't need to say that something's allowed because it's confusing if it's allowed, but you still need to get a permit. Well, right. why doesn't that make it a okay. permitted use? So exempt means it does not require a permit. Right. But 
exempt does not mean that it is exempt from any and all regulation. Because, for example, there was there was one standard that was written that was that talked about rules that were applied to an exempt use. Even though it was exempt, it still had rules. So I wanted to, and I liked that. So I wanted to make sure yes. that it was clear that just because you don't require a permit doesn't mean you don't have to follow the rules. So you have to follow the rules in order to be exempt. Okay. Farm, farm agriculture is a good example that mm -hmm. farming in Vermont is only exempt from local zoning to the extent, extent to which it meets the state's requirements and definition of a farm, a farm structure. Okay. okay, so someone doesn't look at exempt and think, great, nothing applies to me. Should, do, should we be clear about that? that? There is language here about, you know, uses that are exempt under statute, I think. Uh, and in each one of those cases, I believe I make reference to the statutory exemption. Okay. And your zoning administrator would make that no. point when okay. the question comes up is that, you know, and it's not it's not required to get a permit under Jericho zoning, but is this in regard to housing on farms? Uh, no, this is more with regard to farms and farm structures themselves, accessory on farm businesses. And what else on the table is exempt that's not on a farm? What else gets an E? So greenhouses, maple sugaring, stables, um, those are all exempt. So I, think, I want to build a sugar house on my property over there. You want to build a sugar house and your sugaring operation falls under the qualifications of the Ag Food and Markets Agency, then you can do whatever you need to do in order to conduct Without it. applying for a permit. Without a local zone. But also, if I want to build a tool shed at my house, no foundation, small size, I think that doesn't need a, stuff like that doesn't necessarily need a permit. Right. Either. There, there's language in the right, but I still about accessory to, structures. But I still have to comply with a setback. Yeah. So that's an example where I don't need a permit, but I still have to follow the rules. Well, you would need you. Yes. Yeah. There, there's a there's a threshold size limit under which you don't need to get a zoning permit, yeah. provided that you yeah. you meet the setback requirements. Or okay. Similar question, but different. If we, if there is a use, principal use, and then accessory uses, there was some text in there that that said you have to comply with the standards, but it, it wasn't totally clear. Is it the superset of standards of principal plus accessory? You have to comply with it all because you might, because the uses may have very different requirements. You're going to have. In most cases, you're going to have a principal use and you're going to have one or more accessory uses, which may or may not be individually regulated. Example being home occupation, right? There are specific standards around how home occupations can happen. <clears throat> so everything is going to be guided by whatever requirements there are for that principal use. That accessory, those accessory uses are things that are are subordinate to the principal use and are customarily associated with it. You know, so unless there are specific requirements in the code about, oh, you can't do these things as an accessory use or, you know, an accessory use of this nature um, triggers these kinds of regula regulatory requirements, then you don't have to deal with it at all. If you have a mixed use site and you have, you know, Residential units upstairs, you have a variety of different non-residential uses downstairs, and one of those uses is a conditional use, then that that use, that that portion of the building or activity, gets treated as a conditional use. Not the whole thing, though. Right? You've got right. you've got three commercial units on downstairs, you've got a restaurant, you've got a hair salon, and you've got a retail store. If one of those is a conditional use and it's the restaurant, then only that restaurant gets treated as a conditional use, not everything else. I wonder if one of the things... I'm sorry. Oh, please. Chris is trying to make a point here. Um, Chris says, 
For efficiency and timing, PC should develop our questions notes. We can cover them in work sessions. Let David make the presentation. The PC should not worry about this. It is the zoning administrator's job to rule on. <clears throat> so that's the point he wanted to share with us. Thank you. Um, one of the things that would be helpful is if this, well, we understand completely that we are lay folks and therefore will not understand it in quite the same way that either David or Chris would. Some of the ways that this is is written now, it is confusing the kinds of questions that Susan is asking. So one of the recommendations I will just point out to you is um, pertinent to this point on 4.4 table of uses, which is on page, I have no idea what page it is. I would love to tell you if I could. Um, what page this is. Um, there's, there is something about an accessory use not specifically listed should be considered prohibited unless the zoning administrator determines that the accessory use is in there are three bullets. Yep. I have read that paragraph like five times now. I have no idea what it means. I have no idea as somebody who is trying to figure out what's allowed and what's not allowed. It has not shed any light for me. Um, and so I just would encourage, we don't have to solve for it right now, but that's the kind of statement where if our goal is to simplify and be transparent so that decisions for people who want to undertake new development, which is what we're trying to in inspire, understand what the parameters are, this is not, this is not a piece that I think is fully transparent and understandable. So you don't have to answer to it now. Just I would put a put a note right there yep. that there there is a piece where this question of what's in and what's out and how they layer up together that which is where Susan was going. How things layer up together is still not clear because it's so easy to get to move into the details without having that yeah. full overview. So Chris Lynn is saying, "Come talk to me," but I agree the language is not intelligible. So pretty standard lang zoning language right. around accessory use. So I understand, yeah. like like yeah. Heidi just said, to you and to Chris, it is. But if I'm like opening it to find out, can I put a shad or a sugar house? I mean, I don't know. So you call your friendly neighborhood no. zoning minister. I know, but I think we can do better. Well, I would just second what I think that I think the difficulty is that you can't anticipate every possible accessory. No, I, don't, I don't think that's what we're asking for. I think just it's not intelligible at all. Yeah, I think so, David, what it is is sort of you've done such a beautiful job with the table that made it so much more clear than it was before. Mm -hmm. But you have beautiful categories, you have definitions, and you have categories, and most of it I can come into and understand what's in and what's out, mm -hmm. right? And this might be one where it's not the words, but it's a graphic. I know we don't tend to use graphics in something like this, but it's like where that, how things ladder up and what's in and what's out and when you need to go in a different path, like a flow chart or something like that could be an attachment, just like you did for us in the presentation so beautifully mm -hmm. before where you, you made some graphics that helped us to get oriented about here are the steps and here's what then is in or out. That's where it's easy to get lost when one is not accustomed. And that I think would serve as a grounding point, particularly in our public processes that are part of what hold up development is when people don't understand and then they delay. Mm -hmm. And they delay yep. and they delay. So the more that we can do to help make it as clear as possible, not only to those who are in the know, but to those who are trying to make change or prevent change by making it simple would be helpful. So the confusion is not just about what constitutes an accessory use. It's about the relationship between yeah. the standards that govern them. To add. I had a, an example. I yes. give it to you after the fact. Yeah. It's sort of like, well, which do I have to make sure I do both of these things? This is a bad example, but if you had like this, which is no retail, and your accessory use is a retail, well, retail has issues. I need to have handicap parking. I need to have this. I need to have that. But if it's an accessory use, 
do all those things that would otherwise apply if it were a primary use still apply? Yes. It's a mechanical yep. question. Yep. And but it is true, especially since we're banking banking a little bit on infill, we want people to feel like it is a welcoming, accessible document, not that it's so complicated and they have to go to the zoning administrator because people work during the day. They can't always go to or email the zoning admin. You know what I mean? Like so just constantly simple, 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 clear, clear, yeah, clear. Accessible, accessible, accessible. Okay, similar, not different question now. So special residential uses, there's a lot of senior housing in there, but the but the term senior housing in and of itself is defined in the definitions, but it's not in the table. Did you intend that? You don't have to answer that exactly, but a, a takeaway is seems a little discrepant, I don't know if that's correct grammar, but seems um, inconsistent that somewhat larger scale senior housing developments are allowed in many districts, but certain multi-unit house uh, residential types, which would in effect be much smaller and have much less impact, are not allowed. And it's, I obviously have nothing against senior Housing, I, I'm just, I just think that that seems inconsistent if, if part of what we're thinking about is impact rural areas, transportation for people, services for people, um, a large scale facility. I'm not sure that's where that should be. Okay, no, that's, that's helpful. Um, so senior a definition of senior the reason why that is in there but it's not in the use table is because you have a senior housing bonus i repeat mm -hmm. so senior housing bonus what's it for okay you need to we need to define what's it for okay can we can we back up to 2.2 mm -hmm. multiple household units especially i want to you know make sure that we're addressing the recommendation of the housing committee Number one, permit a minimum of four units of attached multifamily housing, four plexes in all residential zones. And I'm wondering how folks feel about that because I agree. I think it should be um, permitted. Yeah, I agree. And I'm also, um, so that's one point. I don't know what, I have other folks, so I'll, I'll wait until other people share their perspectives. Wendy, can you just say that again? Um, permit a minimum a minimum of four units of attached multifamily housing, so fourplexes in all residential zones. Right. So Chris is saying we talked about it last week, so we did talk about it last week. Okay. So we just don't want to miss it being in your table. So it's in the table. Um, I did not make changes to the low density residential district. Right, and I think we would like to. See that's that. so. That's what you're saying is that you want it to apply there as well. That's permit. And then can I there's there's some there's some symbols. I don't know whether they're symbols or they're lines to comments, but for example, a 2.2.5 under the commercial district, it, it looks like it's a like a little red triangle or inverted triangle. Is that not really is that a symbol or is that what is that? <laughs> yeah, because I mean I didn't know something out. Yeah. What is that little red? Because it, it, there's a couple of them. It, I'm sure it means that something was taken out. I the little triangles um, is like an anchor point for uh, a balloon in the margin. Uh, it's not a symbol that I've added okay. with any intent. Okay. So, and so if it's so, uh, it's blank. So that means that multi household units ten or plus. Are not permitted in commercial. Am I interpreting that correctly? Multi house unit 10 or plus, 10 plus is not permitted in the commercial. Could be if you want it to be. I think it should be. I mean, where else it, would it go? And it, we always kind of go back to the let the market decide mm -hmm. where development, what, where development occurs. And I feel like that ethos would be it's consistent to apply yeah. in this situation. I'm wondering whether or not 
Never mind. Is that 10 plus units? That's a new kind of threshold or the number of units that I added. Um, previously, it was probably five or more. But it looks like five or more was permitted in the commercial district. So permitted or conditional use? Uh, there's a black P there. So yeah, I think it was permitted. It looks to be permitted. Can I just ask a process question? Yep. Because Chris has again said put it into a work session. What is the difference between a work session? So and we need to theoretically the goal of today is to let the consultant present to us his red lines and his reasoning high level. Okay. And then we can collectively get together and debate them without him. Thank you. <laughs> but, but I would Sometimes just... your expertise is really helpful. Yes. 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 helpful. That's why I was just asking. It, yeah. It's a time management thing, yeah. though, that my okay. my our budget for this project is getting consumed rapidly. Okay. So I don't have a whole lot of hours. Yeah. We we also found it helpful in some cases to ask Chris Lynn a bunch of clarifying questions. Right. That's fine. Okay. okay. I just wanted and, to yeah. But, but really I, think all the comments important. I just I want to push back a little bit because I think it's important to have some discussion. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we can't just listen to you. But I want right. before we leave the three and four household unit, um I I'm not I want to clarify or understand that we do we not want to also in forestry and rural agricultural. We, we do, and that was part we of the conversation we, last week. We didn't week. just say that a minute ago. So I think we right, should. you did not. But we should. So if, I only spoke to the low density residential right. district. Uh, yes, I, I, but I think we should have it everywhere. Yes. Yeah. Even the river district. Well, everywhere that uh, that a single family house is. It's a lot size. It can prove that you were in the river district within the housing tract. A little wedgy about the forestry district, only partially because anticipating the Act 250 modernization changes. I know it's very hard to take away once you mm -hmm. swing the pendulum, and I know that we're going to get much clearer definitions about mapping, and our districts might change. So I personally don't support going going that far into the forestry district, mostly because I don't. Want to get caught, but with an unintended what would be the objection? consequence. Um, because I think we have to anticipate that some of that some of that land is going to get taken off the table for for development. I don't understand. By the Act Two Fifty, what do you mean? Like they're, they're going to expand the developable space? There, the the state is more explicitly going to define areas that are set aside for no development sure. or for very minimal development. So you should ban single family homes very until they get the answer. Development. And um well uh, my question is I don't I guess I don't understand why we would treat it differently than a single family house. Because it's not necessarily bigger and it's not necessarily more cars, not necessarily more people. So well, what would the objection be? What more cars, more right, but it's not necessarily those things. Right. right. It might be fewer cars, yeah. it might be fewer people. And if if the state is going to say you can't build in this district, then that wouldn't that apply for single family houses as well. Right. I, I, just, I, I don't, don't know. I'm, I'm not sure why it would, it would be act, you're talking about act two fifty jurisdiction. Well, <laughs> not just not like the way it is now, but the new map. You know right. how they exempt the new down jurisdiction. Down? Right. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. I, I I agree with you that like why can one person build a two, twenty thousand square foot house with a swimming pool and an indoor basketball court, but you can't build a which fourplex. Is more invasive which is way more invasive environmentally. And a riding yeah. rink and a and a right. you know, twenty thousand so, square foot indoor riding rink and you can't three UPS deliveries, a landscaper, nanny, so I luxury about, locker. I worry about all those things too. And so I think about tools like the building envelope and so if I you don't really those are all really tools forward. to, to think about when you get there. Yeah. This actually I would agree is a work session. 
conversation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's an important conversation. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. what is I want to, I, I, I don't want to short script it, which is what might happen if we don't label it as like, let's really like dig into this one because this okay. seems to be. I will await further direction. Core. Okay. Ah, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Well, Very good one. How do we how do we live yeah. by the values and visions of increasing housing and balancing? Yeah. Other things relative to uses. Um. I. Oops. I've been talking a lot. Heidi, were you go up to the front? Please go. Okay. Um. I'm looking at um five five point nine schools and childcare, and I'm thinking about if. We want to uh, reduce barriers for people who um, want to have a child care business, home business, or a center business. Then it should. I I am advocating for a permitted use, not conditional, to reduce barriers. So which which use and where? Um, child care. I see center based child care and preschool. I don't know where home. Home-based child care falls under, or maybe it doesn't because it's a home occupation. But it's a next. It's in the next uh, grouping six point okay. accessory uses. Oh, it is already permitted. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, because it's associated with a single family or. Okay. Single family. So then the concern with center-based child care is about traffic because it's very dependent upon the, the size of the child care mm -hmm. center. And, and ultimately, you're you're only going to put those things in places where there are concentrations of, of people who, where they can easily get to them. And I would think about at least maybe the village having it permitted in the village. Mm -hmm. I think they are all permitted in all of the village settings. <clears throat> the, the center base looks like mm -hmm. additional on the village. Oh, maybe so, oh, no, 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 it's ready. No, we it's, can we can move it to a, a work session as well. I just wanted to bring that up. Mm -hmm. um, and then this again, sorry for my ignorance, but I'm looking at the housing, and then I'm looking at the commercial. Where am I? Sorry, I switched slides because I was looking for. Uses. There we go. Um. Just because there's a lot of chatter about within the the lack of accessible of housing, about mm -hmm. the fact that there are many towns are now looking at the mix of housing that is where people who are living permanently versus those that are available as short term rentals mm -hmm. or seasonal rentals. Do we have anything in here? And is that something that would go here in uses? Or where would that issue be addressed if we should choose to address it? I'm not suggesting we, it would be for a conversation yes. for later, but it's just where would that fit in this whole scheme? It would go in this section, okay. and it's a whole conversation of its own. Okay. Yeah. So I would like to, if it's okay, folks, to say that we might want to have that conversation. Short-term rentals. They're yeah. making a distinction between occupancy of 30 days or more, 30 days or less. I just, I, I don't know, and it might be something that we chat about with our housing subcommittee. Maybe they've mm -hmm. already talked about it, but I'm noticing that I'm not seeing something that speaks to that. Nope, there's nothing in here about short-term okay. Thank you. I just, uh, I'm skipping all the way down to 6.6, .6, sale of motor vehicles, and wondering why it's... Oh, I'm going to ask you, don't go there yet, because I have one more okay. question on the table. Okay. Um, ADUs, so currently it's ADUs shall be approved as an accessory use to a single household dwelling unit. Um, so that means that a duplex or a triplex, one of those units there's no way for them to have an ADU. Not as currently written. Okay, so Correct. that's something I guess that we can discuss. Next. You could they want allow an ADU to be associated with well, any number. Three, of, right, right. One of three units. Or, right. Yeah. Right. And is there any big reason why we wouldn't want to do that? Well, I think <clears throat> it comes down to how are they how are they laid out? 
So you've got a single household unit and you've got an ADU, that's pretty simple. If you've got, a, say, a townhouse, um, you might have an attached ADU component to that. But if you're in a multi-unit building that you know has already got three or four or more units in it, how how do you associate uh, an accessory unit to one of those apartments physically? Physically, I don't know. Legally, I think it would be simple. Right. You know, it's condos, and I own the condo, and right. I've got the shed in the back. Those was my con. Actually, I had this situation in a two-family flat, and the basement was an ADU belonged to one of the flats, okay. not the other flat, and they were not connected. I mean, they were in the same physical yep. building, but it didn't have its own legal documentation to be. could not be sold separately because it was in an area that was only zoned for two family, not three. Yep. But it was clearly an ADU. Clearly an ADU associated ADU. with an individual. One of the two duplex units. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Okay, so we'll talk. Yep. We should all move to Austria where you build a four-level house in, in the basement, walk-up basement with the grandma. Mm -hmm. And then you live on the first floor, and then your kids live on the second floor, and then you rent the third floor. Yeah. There you go. Right. Okay. That's where I live. All right. So back to you, Wendy. Okay. Because I just wanted to. Okay. So I'm looking at six point six point six sale of motor vehicles. I'm referencing the definition, which is motor vehicle sales. So if it looks like we're permitting the 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 display and sale of more than one motor vehicle in all districts. And I'm asked, do we want that or do we want to change the definition of motor vehicle sales? Like that, that, that is a little bit higher of a threshold. Like to me, there's a difference than having it one's personal vehicle or tractor or whatever motor vehicle you have and you put a for sale sign out and it's <laughs> in the driveway towards the road versus having 10 vehicles out. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that we're permitting that 10 vehicle sale in all areas of Jericho. Mm -hmm. that so based on the definition, you're referring back to the definition in section two. <laughs> yeah. That, it, it's definitely something I have to look at. Um, you know, that's like that that sale of a motor vehicle is existing language in the in the code, but I think you identify an important place. So let me make sure that the definition doesn't trip these two things yeah. up. Well, what, yeah, what about a hundred motor vehicles? Mm, right. Such. Okay, any other big burning questions on uses? Eric, are we, are we, you haven't tried to chime in that we haven't heard you at all? No, I'm, I'm good at this point. Uh, I think we should revisit the motor vehicle issue. Yeah. Uh, and some of the accessory dwellings, the only thing I would say is, you know, it doesn't make it clear whether we can have an accessory dwelling with an accessory dwelling in it on that, just a number of units, but... I think that's as as uh, Chris has been saying. That's for a work session for here. Right. Okay. Moving yeah. on. Yep. Briskly. <laughs> Come on, this is an engaged planning commission. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So last section here are the dimensional standards. So again, I integrated the comments from back in the spring, um, specifically for uh, ensuring more compact um, development in the village center. So no minimum lot size or density limits, uh, smaller setbacks. Um, and there's, and I also eliminated the density limit tied that tied single units and that was tied to single units and duplex. Right, all density calculations in the core current code is tied to uh, single units and duplexes, um, as opposed to 
If your use table says you can have a four unit residential building on a lot, that's all you need to know. And then you define how big the lot isn't. You, if you don't have a minimum lot size, then it doesn't matter. If you have a minimum lot size, then you can still have a four unit building per the minimum lot size. That's what density should be. It's not, it shouldn't be based on some kind of other th making reference to the single family and duplexes in the current code it just doesn't make any sense to me. <clears throat> so that was uh, a substantive change. So I will stop sharing the slide and pull up that section and you can see what it looks like. And I will note something that I found in going through this earlier today is this table that table is missing the Riverside Center neighborhood. <laughs> Oops. That's why we do this, right? That's why it's an iterative process. Yeah. Uh, so I have since added another column there for the Riverside Center neighborhood, and all those dimensional standards are the same. Um, again, if following that today, all of these three geographic areas are all treated the same uh, as Village Center District. So, I, for dimensional standards, yeah. yeah. So I I corrected that from the get. <clears throat> so. Okay, burning questions on dimensional standards. Well, I, I, I think at one at some point maybe this is for work says yes. is to look at minimum rows front frontage in all districts for work says. Oh, I have a I have a question. I think I would enjoy an answer to now. <laughs> um, maybe <laughs> I don't know what the answer is. Um, under minimum road frontage and minimum front yard in feet in the village centers, um, there's a minimum and then there's a maximum. Why is there a maximum under a minimum? If you're looking at the minimum front yard size. Why, why would I then talk to season and say maximum? So it's simply a matter of the language. You would remove minimum from the first column because in some cases it is simply a minimum. In some cases there is a minimum and a maximum. But if somebody has an odd shaped lot, what if the front, of the house, you know, it's a super small lot, but the front happened to be 30 feet wide, then we're not going to allow them to build there. I don't understand why. I'm sorry, ask that again. I don't understand why we care how wide the lot is at all. Well, the width, the width of the lot is uh, is actually really important to trying to maintain an existing pattern or allowing for a compact pattern by yeah, but that doesn't ensuring that it for, does, that you can build it small. That doesn't account for a funky shaped lot, which would be non-conforming, but you'd still be able to develop. Well, but it might. It just might be a leftover piece that is a legitimate lot. It just the front happens to be 30 feet instead of 25. Right. Is, is and, that's not, and that's not a problem. It's just that not says that the 25 is the maximum. Right. But if you've got a pre existing 30 foot lot, then it's a pre existing non conformity. But it's not pre existing if you're in the process of dividing. Right. You couldn't create a 30 foot lot. That's if the maximum is only 20. That's, that's what Chris is saying, that this prohibits us from creating an odd-shaped lot. Yeah, and, and unless you you got some dimensional waiver from the DRB. Isn't this depth, not width? Well, this is, no, this it's is only width. width. This is width. width. Uh, 25 feet for a mobile home. Uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just not sure why we 
So the and so so to Michael's point though, this is a the minimum front yard is a depth. That's the front yard setback, not the width of the lot. Road frontage is the width of the lot. Six fifty, right? So the the maximum road frontage is seventy five feet, but a minimum of fifty. One could argue, do you need a minimum at all? And when you see the form code, you'll see that there are a lot of minimums that just don't exist. Mm -hmm. Because they're kind of unnecessary. Well, what do you think? Do you think we need a minimum if there's some... A road frontage? Probably not. Um, you could eliminate the minimum front yard uh, as well. If somebody wants to build closer than five feet because of the setting that they're in, is that a problem? What's more important in these situations are the maximum. You're trying to ensure that the buildings are closer together and that they and can be closer together, but that they will will be closer together and closer to the closer to the street. But they don't necessarily have to be right on the street. This is really helpful information. To know where the boundaries are, what's allowed, what somebody has is allowed versus in practice, and what we were saying that the practice has been, but we can change that. That we're not bound by what's on this paper right now. Right. And so maybe that is a longer conversation for us to have. For you to think about while you're here, since yeah. you were familiar with Burlington. Yeah. And I've done a project in Burlington in a while, but when we did projects in Burlington, there's ruling on frontages was. The average of you know the two houses on either side of you. So yeah. the, the idea was to for some sort of the setback distance. The setback distance for general street continuity. Yeah. So this that's a different way of looking at this than what we have. That's kind of cool. Um, and in fact, Burlington's regulations does Burlington's regulations uh, provide for both, but they're still but they are still trying to require that. You're, you're maintaining an existing pattern, but the buildings are closer to the street. So if there's an outlier, it gets thrown out. If there's a building that's 30 feet from the road, you know, it's not counted. Because you you want those buildings closer to the street. And, and in that kind of an urban context, I would say there are plenty of situations where you would require the building to be at the front property. Zero, min, and max, setback in order to maintain the street wall. But that's not the situation. Any sure. So if somebody does it, great. If somebody doesn't do it, that's fine too, because that's part of the existing path. So yeah, I'd love to come back and have a conversation about the question you're raising, Chris, and whether or not we feel we do need to have a minimum road frontage or a front yard. Like, do we really need? I, I mean, I see that we have what David has presented to us is in the centers. He's reduced the number, mm -hmm. but never, not really eliminated it other than the minimum lot area. And so, is that a conversation that we want to have mm -hmm. together and just dig a little deeper? And then, I think the other question that Chris has raised that deserves some conversation is. What is the downside of having odd lots? Like if our goal is to increase opportunity for development and the land is such that you've got this odd non-conforming thing, why would we not allow that to happen? You, you will always allow it to happen. Oh, you if, would. if it's an existing non-conforming non situation, you're always going to allow that to happen and to continue forever uh, unless somebody wants to change it. And, the, and they can change it to become I think I got lost with the word existing. So in the table here, I thought this meant when you're starting a new development and therefore it's not existing, you've now created something new, therefore it's not existing. Maybe I don't understand. So if, it's ex if it already exists, then say that road frontage yeah. um, standard wouldn't apply if it's different. That's that's fine. It can continue to be, continue to be that. If you are creating a new lot, then you would need to satisfy the minimum and maximum 
That's street right. fronted. Yeah. So you don't want to have a lot of odd lots. You don't want to create odd lots if you don't have to. And there may be a situation where you've got the lots are configured in a certain way or the land is configured in a certain way that you can't avoid creating something that is a little, maybe a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller here or there. That's what the, that's what the waivers that, that the DRB true. can grant are all about just for those kind of situations. Right. And, I, and I emphasize that's a waiver, not a variance. Variance is a different because okay. you wouldn't get a variance for that. Thank you. Okay, other uh, dimensional standards questions? Not right now. If we can agree to come back to them in a work session. Yes. Okay. Yep. And and in the work session where we do have the next section down, David, if you keep going down, I think it's 5.10. This is where I got lost. The pre-existing lots, minimum setbacks. We haven't changed anything in there. And so is that something that could be changed? Like we're again, we're looking at making things easier for people to create more housing or create more something. I'm just not clear in this pre-existing lot minimum setbacks and feet, why it's a different box and we are not looking at whether we want to make changes there. Um, that's not something that I really looked at in any detail. It's a pre-existing language and I didn't see it as affecting what we were trying to create in the village district. So, they, they so that's assuming that, that there might be an existing empty lot in Riverside. And we might not want the minimum front yard setback to be 25 feet. So the first part of that minimum lot size is the statutory requirement that even if you have an undersized lot, you still have to be able to develop it. Um, We can get this in a work session. Yeah. Too. Yeah. So yeah. maybe, but also, we don't necessarily know. So maybe you could digest that, think about it. Yeah. The overall sense is that you want to provide as much flexibility as possible, especially since we're driving toward the end zone. And balancing that with also trying to make things somewhat harmonious, for lack of a better right. word, mm -hmm. but, and somewhat consistent but not really don't really want to force people into a box just because something is the way that it is if we don't have a good reason for it yep. either safety or you decide who benefits well and Susan this is exactly where I looked at this box and I thought does it prevent us from doing it well mm -hmm. yeah okay anything else on dimensional standard not from me not from you <laughs> Not me. Nothing from me. Okay. Good. All right. All right. So thank you, David. Maybe as we. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Well, oh. just um, because I know this is something Susan wanted to talk about. Oh, just stop. Stop. You want to talk about schedule? Yes, that was my next question. <laughs> but before we wrap this up, can we just look ahead for the schedule? So here it is, okay? Yes. So, so there's months, but not dates. <clears throat> well, I'll show you different. Is there a hard but, deadline with the grant? Uh, it's just... uh, <laughs> I think we're a, we'd be okay on timing. If it's really more a matter of money, we will have exhausted our funds by a certain point in time. Sounds like practically tomorrow, but wasn't the deadline on the grant somewhere like January or March to have everything approved? I think it's longer than that. The deadline on my contract is the end of the calendar year, but that can be extended. We have plenty of time though, either way. Great. Right. Once upon a time, we were aiming for 
public hearing with the select board at the beginning of June. All right, so this is yeah, absolutely. I've worked yeah. up this schedule. Mm -hmm. Can you make it just a little bigger? How's that? Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, top of the screen is where we are uh, right. So I emailed Chris today with a red line version of Section 13 of Riverside Code. So you'll get that in shortly and can begin chewing on that for a subsequent conversation. Um, I have then, after that, put in here are some alternate dates. Um, I'm pushing the envelope a bit here to to even suggest that October 1st could be a work session on the Riverside Code. I only say that because I'm having my knee replaced next week, and uh, that will be less than a week from my surgery date, and I may or may not be good company. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> it depends on what drugs they give you. Exactly. And maybe you're really good company or not. Right. So, yeah, really. Um, that sounds good. Would you be able to be with us when it's done on the 15th? I would, you know, it, in either case, it would probably be Zoom. Because the question of I may not be driving. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, I'll be driving by the 15th. But yeah, okay. Definitely not by the first. Because we might need to use the first to do the follow up mm -hmm. of all the things we just yeah. talked about. Yeah, I like think that's a good point. And then we just, for me, we'll just plan on the 15th. Mm -hmm. So that then pushes all of the subsequent dates there to the second suggestion. So, um, and pushes the completion of this, depending on what the select board chooses to do, to either um January or March because of the public hearing requirements basically you're unless you're going to hold a, a special meeting even the planning commission a public hearing happens a month after you warn it because you meet every two weeks so Election or you decided we're not is an election is election day, yeah. So you're not gonna meet that day. Um in, okay, so we'll work with Chris, yes. which we can maybe do through email. Since we're not gonna meet on election day, I might request if people would consider meeting on a different day in November to make up for that meeting. When and we'll work with Chris to figure out, or it might be our new person when the room is available. Yeah, whose name is also Chris. No, they, like, that's <laughs> when the, our, that's the room is available and all of us are available. So I'll share this with Chris and okay. you can have a conversation. Okay, but I ideally you're looking at like when do you think we'd have all of the red line all together? Is that deliverable number five? That is deliverable. Yes, deliverable number five. So that's early December. Um, I'm sorry, no. Um, deliverable number four is the complete is kind of all of the red line versions together after you've had your conversation. Delivered number five is what you're saying to the select board. So okay, it's not... it's uh, it's the middle, say the middle of October, depending on when I get all the comments, how many there I was are. I was gonna say, like, does that give you time to actually make the changes that we put so like what we decided on last week was a lot yeah see i've not seen any of that so yeah i i i assume my my working Mostly assumption we were taking stuff out so yeah. well that that may be just fine um my my working assumption is a couple of weeks to turn those things around and with the hope that they're going to come somewhat sequentially i'm not going to get them you know all at once right but, right okay so i think back to one so, responses yeah. are ready for you as soon as chris massages them for you okay 
And then we'll meet October 1st and try to have the exact number two to you soon thereafter. Hopefully we can get through all that in one meeting. Yep. But in theory, when we get deliverable number four, mm -hmm. that we would have already approved. It should be what we're expecting and we would already have approved everything. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. What I'm a little right. It's a little optimistic. I think that we'll all get it right the first time. So I think the planning commission should probably maybe think about whether or not we could have an additional meeting in October and a substitute meeting in November if people are willing to do mm -hmm. that so we can stay. Because I I know I really would, would prefer that we don't go into March. Um because we want to move on to other things and we want these regulations to be out in the field so that people can start making their plans. For sure. But I know that means also that we have to be there. Okay, anything else? Thank you for the schedule. That's it for me. I'm hesitant only because it's quarter to nine. So I would say, is there some of you could briefly okay super briefly super brief it appears to me that you're not protecting the river quarters you're removing protections on the quarters and these are really essential to the health of the town uh, how it perceives itself the animal connectivities um, i see a whole development of waterfront properties in our future and well we're this is doing nothing about the river, the, all the protections that we currently have about river corridor development are unaffected. Okay. They stand. That's because it's part of the overlay. Right. That's what I care about. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That was so less than a minute. Well, let him talk. So when, are you, when are you meeting with Underhill? Um, <laughs> I uh, have that in a, in a discussion with uh, Chris Flynn. So we don't have a date yet, but it's on the radar. I, I continue to be disappointed that you've decided these are privileged documents not available to the public or the housing committee. I really don't see why they need to be secret. I've asked for them and been refused, saying that they're privileged. Seems simple enough to give people who are interested the opportunities to look at what you're doing mm -hmm. as you're doing, particularly people in the housing. Mm -hmm. We feel that way about the Du Bois and King uh, uh, stats, you know, it, 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 we don't have access to access to them, and I think they could be very helpful. Yeah, I think really works that very well. And we can help them. Okay. All right. So we're going to close this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thanks for your attention. All right. So moving on then. Um, events so we had the farmers market table that was way before this our last meeting so that, that actually is from before uh does anybody have any updates of anything they've done or are about to do they want the planning commission to know about them? Yeah, you guys actually do have to take your conversation with the, i know from being on the zoom closer to you than it is to when us. people talk in the room it's really impossible here but thank you very much. For thank you. David, you. that was great. Thank you. We'll be nice to see you. Good luck with your surgery. Yes, thank you. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Get it done. Yep. Okay. Any reports on anything anybody's done or going to do? Nope. And the only thing was the protest for the having somebody at the table for the 10 to 5. Yes. So I have that on my That's list. Separate. Okay. Yes. Um, Aaron? Erin from MMC TV. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, I noticed that you skipped approving the minutes uh, and I wondered if you wanted to go back to that before you finish your meeting. Thanks, bye. Excellent. Yes, thank you very much. I was so excited to be here and having this mm -hmm. conversation that I skipped. I also forgot to say that we were talking about parking when I went over the agenda, so. Okay, so we'll finish this topic about upcoming events and then we'll go back and do minutes, okay? Thanks, Erin. Um, okay, so events. On September 25th, Catherine McMains has organized a meeting of all the committee chairs. So I'll attend that. 
Uh, I asked Chris for some advice about what messages he thought I might bring to that meeting. And uh, one of them was to really make sure that all the chairs realize that we have a new planner starting and um, also talking to the select board about providing a, a, as much money and time and effort and resources it's going to take to bring him up to speed. Um, also, I'm just, I've just thought about it here talking potentially, which probably would be offline with Chris, but potentially looking at whether or not we're going to need to extend David's contract because I don't want to get held up by an administrative task. Um, so that's on the 25th. If anybody has suggestions of things that I should tell or ask of other committees, if you would let me know. Then on September 30th is the start date for the new planner. And then we, our first meeting is the next day, on, or yeah, October 1st. So that'll be very exciting to have the new person here. And then October 5th is the first meeting of the three plan to replace traditional town meeting. That's what the little poster is there, the town budget and business kickoff meeting. And there are three requests for PC assistance. The first is that we can have a table like we have a town meeting with materials and meet and greet people on their way in or on their way out. Very informal. Um, had some ideas about that. If anybody wants to staff the table, you don't have to be there during the meeting, just before and after. Um, secondly, the PC will have an opportunity to do a five minute presentation on the town plan and how it relates to the budget. And so if anybody wants to volunteer <laughs> to give that presentation. Maybe someone who's about to move on town or something. <laughs> Maybe Sarah. Oh no, she can't. Well, I don't know if she has, but um, I talked a little bit with Catherine about whether a select board person should do it and because I think we emailed about that and she said she agreed it would be helpful for a select board person to do it, but at this point she thought that we were better versed. Wait a second, how the town plan relates to the town budget? Yes. Well, how do we know that when we're not we're not being included in the town budget process? Well, this is the beginning of the town budget process. So the goal is to inform people about what the high priority items are in the town plan. So that when they're when the attendees are doing work on the budget, they're not starting from scratch, but they're thinking a little bit about what's in the town plan. I would respectfully like to offer that we could sit down with Catherine or whoever and create a script for one of them to say, and if they're not comfortable saying it, then at least script an introduction for one of us to give the content but for them to set the expectation that they have asked us because this is how it will inform decisions. But this is this so, is just to to, punt it to us without them standing like it, it it there needs to be and I'm I would be happy if there would be a opportunity to have that conversation with our select board on the twenty third. I, I would be more than happy to have that conversation. So I offered that. I said we could develop the script, we could develop the slides. It's only five minutes. So, and she thought about it and considered it, but then said that basically she still thought that one of us was was better suited. But, okay, but uh, speaking as for, as someone whose glass is half empty on this, they already explicitly implied that they will not be spending money in any near future on wastewater. So what is the point of our saying we think the town should spend money on wastewater when I don't it's, it's, it's like a setup for conflict. I don't understand. Well I don't think they're setting it. They are not actually we meaning me with the help a little bit from Wendy and Sabina, did advocate to the town plan planning people because on their agenda they had like a visioning kind of exercise. And we suggested if you want to talk to the citizens about visioning, perhaps it would make sense to start with the town plan. And they accepted that suggestion. 
and said, great, but we don't want to just talk about the town plan in the in the abstract. We'd like to connect it to the budget. And um, I said, I think we can do that just so people see, like, if you want to have a connected community, you have to spend money on sidewalks. So the budget doesn't just live as this, like, checkbook. The budget lives as the tool to implement what's in the plan. Love that. I, right. I love it too. And I guess I would go back to what Chris said. It's like if the message isn't coming from the top. You know, sorry to interrupt so quickly and so abruptly, but I think this is the opportunity for us to set the stage. One to be kind of the fall guys for the for the select board to say this is what we, the planning commission, have concluded is necessary. So if people don't like it, they come after us instead of the select board, not necessarily a good thing, but we can also tie it back to all the other work we've done from the members of the community who have said what they want the community to have, whether it's the connected pieces, the bike ped pass, the wastewater treatment, the development in the commercial centers. We're, as planning commission, we're the ones who should be saying, you need budget for this. Let's push for budget at this time. I, I believe we can have a great role in making that happen. I agree with you, Eric. I think what I what I would love to see also, though, is an introduction to Susan or of the plan that says we want to acknowledge all the work that's already gone into this. That this is the, a tremendous amount of work has been done to set priorities and it is our job collectively to figure out how to align the budget with these said priorities like i want to just choose two sentences that's all I, I, I think yeah tying it to what we've done this isn't something we just made out of the out of thin air yeah yeah this exactly all the input. Two right. and actually if that was sabina's suggestion is to really reiterate the process that there were, you know, hundreds and hundreds 100%. of touch points that went into this and that it might actually help many more people see the connection. Oh, I love that. Okay, but I also would point out that um, the town budget as it's set up today is unlikely ever to be a fully adequate funding process for the wastewater project. So at some point, I would go back to Dominic's 10 point list and say this, and this is how to think about this, because if, if the only view of thinking about the wastewater project is the current town budget setup, mm -hmm. we will never get there. Mm -hmm. So it we I don't think it's appropriate for fully appropriate, fully responsible to say just, we think the town budget needs to include money for a wastewater project. I think it should, we should also say that's only one part of how this would ever be financed. What do you mean? Well, I think if we, if we, if, if all we do is say that the town budget needs to include money for the wastewater project, in, in my opinion, that's as good as saying we're not going to develop the wastewater system. Right. So it needs to be also stated that the town budget is a part of that process, but not the full. Right. Oh, yes. It's not it the multi year. We need to expand collectively, expand yeah. the budgetary, our vision of what a budget is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think it would be a mistake to not do that. But yeah, this yeah, is not, this is to not start a right yeah. to not start a capital yes. planning process. Yes. Mm -hmm. To just look at one year, I agree, does not move the needle or change the results. Right. And so I had kind of a spiel in mind that tried to to look at the budget one year, multiple years, because the town plan spans eight years. So it gives you that. It, five years isn't even enough. No. And 10 years just puts you partway through the next iteration of the town plan. So I think, so I, 
I had in mind, you know, like sort of putting on like the long-term planners hat, like literally I was thinking about having a like baseball hat and like, okay, we're the town planners. We have to put on the hat of the people who are looking further down the road. So when you're thinking about this budget exercise that they have planned, um, sure, you're thinking about today and this year and the tax rates and everything, but we're also thinking about what we're trying to accomplish as a community and what it's going to take. And it's not just money and it's not just money coming out of our pockets. It's money that we can access. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a strategy, but just trying to get people to think in, in a continuum. So I had in mind, like, you know, sure, maybe it's a, this little sidewalk segment in this year in this budget, but that's really only one component of this, you know, a whole path that connects here to here. And that's something that is gonna take seven years to accomplish. And showing a few examples from each of the five categories of the plan, probably really will only have time for one example. Mm -hmm. And I think I only have, I have to be very scripted. But I, I think another- Or whomever. Maybe Chris, you should do it. No, but I think another thing that would I think would be incredibly useful for everybody is to have a for the town to issue a plan that says a, a, a money spending plan that says in you know by five years from now these are the this is what we will have done mm -hmm. ten years from now we will have done this so that someone wanting to develop in Riverside can look at that and say okay. They're not going to get the wastewater done until six years from now. Right. So am I going to wait six years or do I want to do my own system? But then they would have, they would know right. that it was at, they, they it was could, on the horizon. It was on the horizon and they could make their own plans and they could take confidence in the town's plan because right now there is no plan. Right. right. So as we all saw from our statutory duties list that we were provided, um, the planning commission may propose a capital plan, so which is what Jim Carroll has been telling us for years, and it was good to be reminded of it in black and white. So we can decide to work on that. So I have this, um, Savita's raising her hand, but then I'd love to jump in. I, uh, Chris says, how about budgeted line items that create a dedicated reserve fund? Right, and that and that's also yes. something that the Affordable Housing Committee suggested in terms of wastewater. But I, I appreciate that. But saving up money takes a lot longer mm -hmm. than applying for public-private partnership mm -hmm. and grant funding from the federal government and stuff like that. So I, yeah, I just feel like the scale of that is much mm -hmm. smaller. But that's not a reason not to do it. That's a yes right. and for me. Yeah. Right. right. Oh, I thought actually that wasn't my thing. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was interrupting myself. Um, you're saying we, we have maybe time in the oral presentation for one example, but maybe we could make some kind of visuals yeah. to have around the room oh, yeah. that give other examples yeah. so that yeah. we're not limiting ourselves just because we only have X number of minutes. And I would yeah. say sort of the same thing. So if we're thinking about we we have at least two options. So far you've mentioned the table, reading in the table, and the other is a presentation. I think you said there's a third that we haven't heard about yeah. yet. Yeah. Um, but it does seem like we could have complementary, deeper information on our table to support whatever you're doing that does draw out that this, you know, the this yearly budget is one component up here that other multiple ways and if we want to get to our goals this is what we're committed to to continue to put on the table including the development of the capital budget supporting the development of the capital budget mm -hmm. but i think if we could do that like in a timeline or some kind of graphic um to have on the table that that it accompanies what you're doing with the examples that could be a really nice take home and reinforce it. And yep. and it is pretty soon. It's like in two weeks. Right. Yeah. So just to be realistic about what what is our collective capacity right, right. to do all the things that we're right. talking about. Right. 
So Sabina made the suggestion in the meeting. So the meeting is structured like a big group, a couple of presentations, one presentation basically on the budget and the process and ballot questions and stuff like that. And then our piece, and then it's breakouts. And they don't know if they're going to get 10 people or 50 people or whatever. Right. So the breakout, Sabina suggested that we could hand out the getting it done charts mm -hmm. so that people are actually seeing like projects and priorities and timelines so that they're not starting from scratch. So that would be available to them. And maybe what you're describing could also be provided to them. We would definitely have getting it done at the planning commission table. So then the third way that we can participate is that if they have these breakout sessions, if anyone wants to volunteer to be one of the facilitators of a breakout session, where, however, they, they're going to have a little Zoom training for facilitators. And if you are a facilitator, they really don't want the breakout groups to get into like negotiating or convincing or, you know, trying to really raise people consciousness to a different level. They really just want it to be somebody who can kind of keep the conversation going and take notes, not really direct and intervene. And there was a little part of me that was kind of thinking about some of what you were, your concerns that I was thinking like, well, we're well suited because we're well versed. But on the other hand, I, we're, we're biased because we almost like know too much. And um, I don't want the planning commission to be a dominating force in this meeting. It's not our meeting. It's a townwide meeting. We're just residents like everybody else. And we got asked to like have a table and make a five minute presentation. That is it. That is what we were invited to do. It, and it, that's it. So we can take advantage of the opportunity, but we're, it's not our meeting, and I and we don't want to be perceived as our meeting. Yeah, I'm less clear on that third part. So, like, like the the first two parts seems like yes, yes that feels yeah, like the right rule. So we're, right. we're 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 facilitating a conversation of people who show up at the table that are interested in the town plan, or just no, we just no. show up. Just Our table with the planning mission is off to the side in the okay. hallway. Okay. The big meeting is okay. Now we're all going to break up into groups, and we're going to in our group talk about the same two or three things, and they're going to have like discussion prompts, like what are you paying attention to in the town, and then they want it, and then we would have the getting it done list really just as like a tool to help the conversation. Would all tables have the getting? Yeah, it done? all tables would okay. have the same thing. All tables would have the same prompts, and. If no planning commission members are facilitators, that's fine because they had a few and they were going to ask people like Elizabeth King who runs the farmer's market, you know, so it doesn't have to be us. I just want wanted to give people the opportunity if they wanted to. If anybody wants to. Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> that's so fine. I am willing, I'm certainly willing to help if they don't have enough helpers, but I would need to look at the agenda and make sure that I could do it without overtaking. There are going to be a few of these meetings? So there's one meeting in October 5th. This format is the only one that's very open ended, brainstormy. What do you think? January will be very specific. To budget line okay, items. Like the town meeting. Yeah, like town meeting. Moderated, Dave Barrington. The only difference is that you don't have like the floor vote, but people can. So the select board will have drafted a budget by that point, and people can say, I don't like the salt budget. I don't like the this. I don't like the that. And that will still all be advisory to the select board. And the group will agree, we want to amend the salt budget, or people disagree. And then the third meeting is March, which is not a meeting. It's just you vote on the budget. And hopefully the select board has incorporated people's feedback mm -hmm. from those two meetings into their work. I so appreciate all those efforts going into this. Yeah, it was a good group of people. Yeah. They worked on it all summer. 
I really do. It's not an easy thing yeah. they've taken on. I just went at the end because I had this sneaky suspicion that they were going to ask us to do something at the last, and I didn't want to get caught not prepared at the last minute. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that meeting. So we can have a table. Do people want to have a table? We don't have to have a table. I plan to go to that meeting regardless, so I'm happy to go and represent the Planning Commission, but I can do it as a member or just as a John Q. I am very comfortable being at a table if I have the well, the, the ideas to be in a, of the action. Yeah, the plan. Okay, yeah. and maybe we can have a couple of copies of other stuff and we can work with our new planner to yeah. help yeah. develop material. Yeah. It would be a good exercise. <laughs> Day four. <laughs> Day four. Day four. Day four. Okay, <laughs> does, uh, does anybody want to do the five minute presentation? I'm happy to do it if nobody else wants it. Listen, I think you need to do it, but if you want us to, if you need a practice zone. Oh, it's kind of a good idea. Right? All right, so I could bring the presentation to you guys for, I guess I do kind of want to do it. You, 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 but need to. I don't want to, you need to. It's you. Thank you for offering that. It's you. <laughs> really, well, Eric, right. now Eric's set. <laughs> right, yes, do it. Eric's set. But I'll bring it so that people can. And maybe Eric and I would do it together, but it's only five minutes, but that's okay. Um, okay, and, and we'll only do a facilitator if they need it. Okay. All right, so those are all my meeting updates. Okay, any other meeting updates? All right, so minutes. Uh, motion to approve the minutes of September 12th. I would like to make a motion to approve the minutes of September 12th. Sarah, and a second? Second. Chris? Any corrections or updates or edits on the minutes? Okay, all those in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 Abstain. Abstain. Heidi and Susan abstain. Any nays? No nays. Okay, so that's the minutes. Any other business? So can we adjourn and then have our snack? Mm -hmm. Okay, so motion to adjourn. So moved. Sabina. Second. And Sarah. All those in favor of adjourn? Aye. 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 Okay.